Please take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Galatians, in the first chapter. I hope that it uh, proves to be a blessing for you today, that you are starting your day with a saddler, and you will be ending your day with a saddler. <laughs> My message this morning is entitled, So Soon Removed. My passage is Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, and we'll read those verses now. Galatians 1, verse 6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. David Holdaway tells the following. He says, two friends, Bill and Tom, were up late discussing the difference between irritation, anger, and rage. At about midnight, Bill said, look, Tom, I'll show you an example of irritation. He went to the telephone, he dialed a number at random, the phone rang and rang and rang. Finally, a sleepy voice on the other end answered, and Bill said, I'd like to speak to Jones. There's no one here named Jones, the disgruntled man replied on the other end, and he hung up the phone. And then he said to Bill, Bill said to Tom, now that's a man who is irritated. About an hour later, Bill said, now I'll show you a man who's angry. He went to the phone, dialed the same number, let it ring and ring and ring and ring. And eventually the sleepy voice answered the phone and Bill said, May I speak with Jones? There's no one here named Jones. He came to the angry reply this time louder and the, the phone was put down firmly on the other end. That is a man who is angry, Bill said at the time. About an hour later at 2 o'clock, Bill said, now I'll show you an example of rage. <laughs> Went to the phone, dialed the same number, let it ring. When the silly leapy man finally answered, Bill said, hi, this is Jones. Has there been any calls for me? <laughs> now, one thing you notice right away as you look at the book of Galatians is that Paul's a little irritated. Paul's a little angry. Paul's not too happy with these churches in Galatia. Now normally at this point in an epistle by the Apostle Paul, uh, in his other letters to other churches at the beginning of his letters, Paul would normally at this point break out with some form of expression of praise, you know, and an expression of thanksgiving for them, for their faith for their faithfulness, for their service to the Lord. But we don't find that here. This is especially striking when you consider it in light of and you compare it to the book of Corinthians. When you think of the Corinthians' blatant carnality and their moral defection from Christ, Paul still commended them. He still offered thanksgiving for them. But here, in the face of a theological, doctrinal departure, a defection from grace and from Paul's gospel, Paul does not offer any commendation or praise for them. And it really shows to us, doesn't it, the importance of doctrine. Rather than offering praise, Paul begins with chastisement and disbelief that they were mixing and that they were allowing themselves to be influenced to mix law and grace, both doctrinally and practically. And they were allowing themselves to be put under law. The Galatians were being told that Gentiles needed circumcision and had to come under the law of Moses in order to be saved. But to Paul, what they were being taught is that Christ and His grace was not enough. 
and that they must have Moses and the law too. And the Galatians were buying into it. And Paul's not too happy about that. And it causes him to rear up and write a strong letter to the Galatians, which extols in every way the all-sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ for our personal salvation and our practical sanctification. The Bible Knowledge Commentary states this about the book of Galatians. Galatians played such a key role in the Reformation that it was called the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. This was because of its emphasis on salvation by grace through faith alone, and this was a major theme of the preaching of the Reformers. Martin Luther was especially attached to the book of Galatians. He referred to it as his wife, which I found to be interesting. He lectured on the book extensively, and his commentary on Galatians was widely read by the common people. The profound influence of this small epistle continues. It is indeed the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, proclaiming to modern generations that salvation from the penalty and power of sin comes not by works, but by grace through faith in God's provision. The influence of this epistle does continue, and the influence of this epistle needs to continue because the church today is faced with the exact same mixing of law and grace, the exact same departure from Paul and from grace truth, and the exact same lack of faith in the sufficiency of Christ to meet all of our needs. Galatians 1.6 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now Paul begins with, I marvel. And that word marvel has a lot of meaning behind it. It means he was astounded. He was bewildered. He was amazed. He found it extraordinary. He was literally dumbfounded. He couldn't fathom why they were so soon removed from him that called them into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Pastor Charles Swindoll writes, Why would a slave, once free, go back to living in bondage? Why would he willingly place his healed ankles back in the shackles that had scraped them raw? Why would he, having breathed the sweet, pure air of the gospel return to the dark, dank dungeon of legalism. For these reasons, Paul says, I marvel. He was astonished. He, he couldn't even conceive why they would desert grace. Why they would desert Christ for the law and for legalism. And Paul's heart is stirred here and, it's, and he's agitated. And he marvels that they were so soon removed, so quickly deserting, so quickly turning away, so quickly becoming of another mind. The word so soon, as far as the time element that it is referring to, may refer from the time of their conversion, or it may refer from the time that the Judaizers, the legalizers, had come in among those churches, and the rapidness of them clinging on to what they had to teach them and the rapidness of their departure from Paul and the gospel of grace. And the Galatians were offering little resistance. They were not taking a stand, and they were being easily influenced by these teachers unto another gospel. In the original, the word removed there in verse 6 is in the present tense. Uh, if you have a different translation, it may say something like being removed or something like that. It is in the present tense, and it shows that the Galatians were in the process of deserting. They, were in the, they had not yet fully turned away. And so that's why this book was written, so that it might try to arrest that defection from grace, that it might stop the progress of their defection from grace. And Paul then turns, as he does, and as God's Word does, and it becomes personal. And he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from my system of theology, from 
Grace theological doctrine. I hope your Bible doesn't say that. I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him. From Him. The Galatians were not just defecting or turning from a system of theology. They were turning from God Himself. I marvel that you are so re soon removed from Him. And so what this teaches us is the gospel of grace is God's truth for today. And to turn away from it is to turn away from God Himself. Amen. Amen. Paul was trying to startle the Galatians to, into a realization of what they were doing. To show the gravity of the situation. He's telling them, you're turning from God Himself. From Him. Now, they, the Galatians perhaps thought that they were honoring God. Because here they were, they were putting themselves under God's law. But in actuality, to do so under grace is to dishonor our God. Paul says that they were turning away from Him that called you into the grace of Christ. The Galatian believers had responded in faith to God's call for salvation, which is made for everyone today under grace. It's God who calls, and He calls today by Paul's Gospel. And Paul's Gospel is available for each and every single person, man, woman, and child. Amen. And as they were called by the Gospel of grace, the question is, why were they going back to another Gospel? Why were they turning back to a Gospel they were not called into? Why were they turning into a gospel that was for a former dispensation, for a former program? And that's why Paul says, well, called unto another gospel, which is not another. Now, the, original, the way it's worded here makes you want to ask. Paul says it's, it's another gospel, but it's not another gospel. And it makes you want to ask Paul. He says, well, Paul, is it another? Or isn't it another? In verses 6 and 7, the word another the two words there are two different Greek words. The word uh, you know, for another in the Greek in verse 6 is the word heteros. And it means another of a different kind. The second another in verse 7 is the word alos. And it means another of the same kind. Now notice that Paul is not saying that the Galatians were being led astray to a false gospel. They were being led astray to another gospel. Another gospel of a different kind. In other words, a gospel which belonged to a former dispensation. They were departing the grace of Christ for another gospel of a different kind. A gospel of faith plus works under the law. And Paul says, which is not another. Which is not another of the same kind which is not another of the same kind as my gospel, is what he's saying. A gospel of faith plus nothing under grace. And it is not another gospel of the same kind of, as Paul's in the sense also, that it is not another gospel for today. There is only one gospel for today. The Paul's gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. Put a gospel in the wrong dispensation. And it's not good news. It's bad news. The gospel of the kingdom is not God's good news for today. The gospel of the grace of God is God's good news for today. What was occurring was that the Judaizers were trying to bring the Galatian believers saved under the dispensation of grace, back under the dispensation of law, demanding works, demanding circumcision, demanding law for salvation. But as one commentator put it, what was really happening was that the legalizers were substituting law for grace, circumcision for the cross, works for faith, bondage for liberty, and self for Christ. And regarding this, Pastor J.C. O'Hara has said, God is very jealous concerning His own redemptive work. It is a serious spiritual crime to offer to saint or sinner a message of grace and law mixed. Amen. 
In doing this, the Judaizers were troubling the Galatians. It says there in verse 7, that word trouble means they were confusing them. It was causing an unsettled mind. And they were also perverting the gospel of Christ. And the word pervert there means to reverse, to turn about, to change to the opposite. And so in demanding works in law, the Judaizers had reversed Paul's gospel of grace. They turned it around, changed its character, and taken it back into the law. Law, works, and grace are absolutely incompatible. As Romans 11.6 tells us, doesn't it? And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Law does not pollute grace. Law reverses grace. Grace can't be modified. Grace can't be changed. And to me, the reason why is because nothing could be added to the grace of God to make it better. We have everything by God's grace, don't we? We have full salvation. We are sealed by God Himself, the Holy Spirit. We are seated with Christ in the heavens by God's grace. By God's grace, we have the very righteousness of Christ. We have a righteous standing in Him, and we are exalted in Him. And He has given us His Holy Spirit within. And we are enabled, and we are empowered. All this by His grace. Nothing could be added to God's grace to make it better. Verse 8 says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Teenagers started work as a florist delivery boy. And one of his first days, he had two arrangements to deliver. One to a church for the dedication of a new building. One to a funeral home. He got confused. And he took each to the wrong location. A little later, the florist received a call from an upset minister. And he says, we got a basket of flowers in the front of our new sanctuary that says, rest in peace. <laughs> and the florist replied, he says, you think you got problems? Somewhere in this town, there's a casket with flowers that says, good luck in your new location. Some mistakes are more serious than others. But to pervert the gospel of Christ is the most serious of all errors. Isn't it? Amen. God wants His message of grace to not be tampered with. God wants His message of grace to be kept pure. But God's gospel of grace and all its purity and all its simplicity and beauty was being confused and muddled and mixed up with works and law in the Galatian churches. And Paul stirred here to the very depths of his being and his language becomes as strong as language can be here. To express the seriousness of the situation, Paul presents a hypothetical situation to illustrate, to convey how important it was to stand for his gospel. And Paul says, but though we, he even includes himself in the hypothetical situation. He says, if I come, if one of my co-laborers were to come, if another apostle were to come, even if an angel from heaven were to come, preaching another gospel, they should be accursed. Now Paul says later in the book, of Galatians in chapter 4 verse 14 that the Galatians had received Paul as an angel of God. And so an angel from heaven here may refer to a messenger symbol who came to them as with false or with true authority from above. And it should be remembered also though as we think of an angel from heaven that Satan and his angels in high places are behind the false teaching and the false teachers influencing them in this world. Now 2 Corinthians 11 tells us, it doesn't, that Satan is transformed into an angel of light 
And it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as ministers of righteousness. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan's goal is always and will always be to blind the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. And Paul takes his illustration here to an extreme point, to an extreme to bring home his point, that absolutely no messenger, no matter how seemingly godly, no matter how seemingly good, no matter how seemingly trustworthy, no matter how seemingly popular, no matter how seemingly religious, no matter how seemingly authoritative, not even if it was an angel from heaven, should be received, should be believed, or should be followed if his or her teaching does not fall in line with Paul's God-revealed gospel of grace. It's been said, truth outranks anyone's credentials. And every teacher or preacher must be evaluated on the basis of what he says, not who he is. And that is important for all of us to keep in mind as we're flooded on the radio and on the televisions and on the internet with, with preachers and teachers. To those who would doubt, to those who would dare to doubt that we are complete in Christ, to those who would dare to add to Paul's gospel of grace, to those who would mix law and grace, to those who would preach any other gospel than his, Paul says, let him be accursed. That's some strong language. Joshua chapter 6, speaking of the city of Jericho, says this, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble. And so for those who would, any, who would preach any other gospel than Paul's, Paul says, let them be accursed. And so like Israel of old, God's people today should keep ourselves from the accursed thing, lest we make ourselves accursed, as through their influence on our thinking and on our lives. And we'd be led astray like the Galatians to another gospel. For those who, Paul says, let them be accursed, we know that there those are those that will stand at the judgment seat of Christ who will reap a curse instead of a blessing. As 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15 says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now the opposite of a curse is a blessing, isn't it? And so, if we take that verse and we reverse it, and we think of it in the sense of one who does preach God's gospel of grace, we see a blessing, don't we? And so any ministry today, regardless of its size, regardless of the size of the building, regardless of the size of the ministry, regardless of the glory of that ministry, any ministry that faithfully proclaims the gospel of God's grace for today, according to Paul, has God's blessing. Verse 9 says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul turns from the hypothetical to the actual. I think when he repeats his burden, now, Paul is not referring to the previous verse when he says, as we said before. The word now in verse 9 is an adverb of time. It implies a lapse of time and a contrast between the present and the past. So when he says, as we said before, so say we now again, he's referring to a previous visit, a previous time among them, and how he had warned them of this earlier. And so this makes his point even stronger 
and the Galatians' defection from Paul even more inexcusable. It's like a, as a parent to a child when you tell them to not touch that glass of water on the edge of a table or something like that. And they do it anyway. And you told them. And it's the same way here with Paul. Paul is saying, I told you this before. And it, this provides reason now for Paul's firm tone throughout the entire book because Paul had warned them of this all before. Now there's contrast between verses 8 and 9. In verse 8, the verse is written from the standpoint of the apostle and his fellow laborers speaking of the gospel which we preached unto you. In verse 9, it's from the standpoint of the convert speaking of the gospel that they had received. The gospel for which Paul was so jealous was the gospel that they had accepted. The gospel that had freed them from their sins and given them eternal life and liberty in Christ. And the element also of a hypothetical situation is removed from though in verse 8, which is though it means an if by any chance anyone should preach any other gospel to you, to a more direct if, as a matter of fact, or if, as is the case, any man is preaching any of the gospel in you. And so that verse is hurled directly at those legalists that were among them and influencing them. The element of improbability is also lessened by the we or an angel from heaven replacing it with any man, anybody. But the anathema remains the same. They let him be accursed remains upon any man who preaches any other gospel than Paul's. And the reason Paul is so firm here is because there are serious consequences to putting both believer and unbeliever under the law. For the believer it includes the loss of liberty, putting them under a law-based, works-based, self-based system rather than having them live vibrantly in the life and power of Christ within. And for the unbeliever, people's eternal destinies are at stake as we consider the importance of the gospel, of what gospel is to be believed and made known today. And this explains Paul's passion for his gospel here. Because if the gospel message for today is confused, people are in danger of being eternally lost. Russ Robinson tells of the Texas Army National Guard, which has a group of special workers called parachute riggers. Their job is to fold and pack the parachute soldiers are used when jumping from airplanes. These people are intensely dedicated to their task. The rigger's creed states, I will be sure, always. They know jumpers need assurance that everything regarding their chutes is perfect. In the time it takes to meticulously pack an MC-11 military parachute, 30 folds are required. A jumper has nothing to do with that chute until they put it on before a jump. Trust in the air-free performance of the riggers is all a jumper can rely on. And the parachute riggers creed further states, I will never let the idea that a piece of work is good enough that could make me a potential murderer through a careless mistake or oversight, for I know that there can be no compromise with perfection. These women know that the parachute business is a life or death enterprise. Mistakes cost lives. There is no room for complacency. There is no room for error. And when we think of the gospel ministry, there is no room for air. Amen. Mistakes cost people their eternal destinies. And as those jumpers need assurance that everything is perfect with their shoe, so men today know, need to know the assurance that the gospel that we give them is true. The one true gospel. And as we rightly divide God's word, rightly divide it between prophecy and mystery, between kingdom truth and body truth, between law, between grace, we can give men that assurance. We know the gospel that is for today. 
The gospel of grace is the only good news that saves men from hell today. This gospel, this glorious gospel proclaims that Christ and His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary are absolutely all sufficient. Amen. This gospel says there is absolutely nothing you can do for your salvation. This gospel says Christ did it all. This gospel says you are saved by grace. This gospel says just believe. Just believe that Christ died for you, was buried, and rose again. And on the authority of God's Word, rightly divided, you are saved from hell. You are forgiven of your sins. And you are heaven bound. Galatians 1.10 says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. In light of all he said to this point, namely the two accursed statements that he just made in verses 8 and 9, Paul says, Paul asks some rhetorical questions. He says, Do I persuade men or do I persuade God? Do I seek to please a man? It seems like Paul may have been accused of being a man pleaser. And his, God, his answer is firm here. Paul says, would I have said these things if I was concerned about persuading men or winning over men or seeking the favor of men? Paul did not soften the truth, did he? Paul didn't compromise it to please men. He sought only the favor of his God. He sought only to please Him. Paul did this by standing for and by proclaiming God's gospel of grace. And so do we. So the convicting point was being driven home here to the Galatians. And it is, who are you trying to please? To the church today, we need to ask that question too, don't we? Who are you trying to please? The Galatians were making concessions trying to please men. They were turning away. They were being weak-kneed under pressure from men. They were taking their eyes off of God and compromising the truth of God's gospel for today. Paul says, if I yet pleased men, if I were still a people pleaser like during his unsaved days as a Pharisee. He says, I should not be the servant of Christ. Upon his salvation, that word servant is the word bondser. Upon his salvation, Paul truly lived for an audience of one, didn't he? His loyalty was to Christ. His desire was to gain his approval. And we see it in his sufferings. How he was beat, and he was mocked, and he was he was thrown around, he was battered, stoned, persecuted, thrown in prisons. And ultimately, he gave his life for the sake of that gospel to stand for. His desire was truly not to please men, but his God. The word servant, bond servant, means being a bond servant, he sought only the will of his master. As a bond servant of Christ, his life was surrendered to the lordship of Christ. His will was lost in his. He sought only to speak His words that He had given Him to speak. And He sought only to please Him and not men. A.W. Tozer says, We are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. And this was surely true of the Apostle Paul and should be for us God's blood-bought children. 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. The act brought him attention he never saw. Luther challenged the theology of the religious leaders of his day in regards to justification by faith and the authority of Scripture. Four years later, in 1521, in Worms, Germany, there was a diet of worms. Now, <laughs> that sounds like a diet that might work. <laughs> But I'm sure it's a diet that's not been tried. Uh, but that this diet of worms, Luther stood before King Charles V, he stood before papal representatives and others, 
And at the Diet, Luther was asked whether he acknowledged authorship of a list of works which had been determined to be an error. And he acknowledged it. He was then asked whether he was willing to recant the errors that were found in them. His answer is the following. Your Imperial Majesty and your Lordships demand a simple answer. Here it is, plain and unvarnished. Since I put no trust in the supposed authority of Pope or of councils, since it is plain that they have often erred and often contradicted themselves, unless I am convinced of error by the testimony of Scripture or by manifest reasoning, I stand convinced by the Scriptures to which I have appealed. My conscience is taken captive by God's Word. To act against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. I cannot and I will not recant anything. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And so like the Apostle Paul, Luther sought the favor of his God only, didn't he? Seeking to please his God only and to stand for him and his truth. And may we be challenged today to stand convinced by the Scripture, to stand for God's Word rightly divided, for Paul's Gospel, for his unique apostleship and message against the popular theology of our day, seeking to please our God only and not man. Verse 11, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the Gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man Neither was I taught. Paul's gospel was being challenged, and in particular, the absence of the law in it. So Paul tells them the source of this gospel. He begins by telling them where the source was not, where it did not originate. It was not after man. And Paul first says, I certify you, brethren. He's emphatic. He uses a strong word, certify, here. To it, and he's attempting to leave no doubt about the importance of what he is about to say. And he's telling them, I made known to you with certainty, I assure you. And then he calls them brethren. And for the first time in the book, we see a tender statement. Even though they were being deceived, and though they were, being defect, although they were defecting from God himself and turning from Paul's gospel, they were still brethren. They were still brothers and sisters needing Paul's counsel. And Paul then reminds them that the gospel which was preached of me, since Paul's gospel was given uniquely and solely to him, it's why he calls it the gospel which was preached of me and also my gospel in other places. Paul told them in verse 1 that his ministry, his mission was not from man. Now he tells them that his message also was not from man. The word preached there is the word evangelize. And so the verse could be stated, the good news which was announced as good news from me, or the gospel which was gospeled by me, was not according to man. It was not human in its origin, not after man, not according to man. It speaks of how it was not conjured up in the mind of a man. It was not human in origin and not human in character. It was not human in authority. Paul did not invent it. Paul did not alter it. And neither did any man. And Paul says that he didn't receive it from any man. Neither was he taught it. Paul did not receive his message from the twelve. Paul did not receive his message from the twelve. Amen. Paul did not receive his message from the twelve. Amen. That's right. The twelve did not teach it to him. The Galatians received it from a man. Paul shared it with them. Paul was not indebted to any man for his knowledge of his gospel. Paul did not receive it from man. It was not communicated to him from a man. It was not transmitted to him by any man. The Judaizers received their message and were taught their message from man, from the Old Testament and the law. Paul, as a Pharisee, was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, didn't he? Gamaliel didn't teach him this, he says. Gamaliel didn't teach me my gospel. <laughs> His gospel was something he received no human instruction about. 
Now, Paul could have been taught his gospel by a man, and it still could have been divine in origin. But Paul says, nobody taught me. Nobody taught me because I was the first to know it, and I received it by direct revelation. As he says, by, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's made it clear where he did not get his gospel. Now he turns to make it clear where he did receive his gospel. And he received it through special revelation from Christ from heaven. His gospel was divine in origin. His gospel was divine in authority. The word revelation means an unveiling of something previously secret or a direct divine communication of a previously unknown truth. Paul's gospel came directly from the Lord because the Lord had something new and unique to reveal to Paul. God was ushering in a secret program and a new dispensation which from the beginning of the world had been hid in the mind of God. And for this secret program and for this secret dispensation, God revealed a unique gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, a gospel based solely on the cross and the resurrection. A gospel which is apart from the law. A gospel which saves any man by grace through faith alone in Christ. A gospel which is apart from works. A gospel which is apart from circumcision. Now while the Old Testament contains the fact of the crucifixion and the fact of the resurrection, through Paul's gospel only do we learn of the full significance of the cross and the glory of its accomplishments on our behalf. And only Paul's gospel holds out salvation through faith alone in that cross. At the heart of the mystery, the revelation of the mystery is the cross. And Paul's gospel tells us how we are justified by faith alone. How we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. How we are at peace with God. How we have access to Him through His shed blood. Paul's gospel was different. Paul's gospel was new. Paul's gospel was unique. Paul's gospel is the only gospel for the day. Right. Because of it being a revelation, the Galatians were being shown something. The body of Christ is being shown something. That we should not question the authority of Paul's gospel. We should not dare to deviate from this divinely revealed truth. Paul's gospel is unchangeable. And so any mixing of law and grace is out of the will of God. No one has any authority to pervert it. No one has any authority to alter it. No one has any authority to add to it because it is of divine origin. Paul received it from God Himself. Paul received it from the Lord Jesus Christ. As this Gospel has been revealed and has been made known, and as this Gospel is the only Gospel for today, so it should be made known now and revealed to all men. It's a message of love, isn't it? A message of love of our Savior and His love providing salvation for all men. Offering reconciliation to all men by faith alone in His sacrifice on their behalf. It is the most glorious, the most wondrous message ever made known to mankind. Praise the Lord. And may we stand for it. And may we make it known. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we do rejoice in Your Gospel for today. And we pray that if there is one here this morning who has not made that decision to trust Christ as their personal Savior, that they, are, they in the quietness of their heart and the quietness of their seat just might believe that Christ died for their sins personally, was buried and rose again the third day. How we rejoice in Your Gospel for today, Father. May we have opportunity to share it. And may we be challenged to stand for it always and to keep it pure and not mixed up and muddled with, with law, but to keep your gospel of grace pure. And we're thankful for the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. And we pray all this in His wonderful name. Amen.